Hi ho, Muppet fans! It's it's Kermit the Frog here with another. No, I, I can't. I can't lie to you guys. It's it's Dan. Don't. <laughs> What's going on, guys? It's Dan here with another episode of Distory, and this time we're looking at the history of my dear friend, Kermit the Frog. Hi, Kermit. <laughs> As you can see behind me, this is just a sample of my Kermit collection that's just littering this set right now. Puppets were a really big part of my life for a really long time. I went to school for theater. I, I started building puppets in high school, and I really look up to Jim Henson. He just liked to have fun ideas and, and make fun things with his friends. And I really, really like to do that as well. And also really important, this video was selected by Marcus Berard, who won the Charityland 2019 auction for picking a Disney Dan video topic. He won, he donated some money to Give Kids the World. It was super awesome. And he was like, hey, evolution of Kermit. And I'm like, hey buddy, you're speaking my language. So thanks Marcus for that donation. Really appreciate it, man. It's going to a really great cause. So to start at the beginning of Kermit the Frog, we have to go all the way back to 1955, the same year that Disneyland was built, because a very young Jim Henson in Washington, D.C., uh, back home, was rummaging through his mother's rag bag, is what she called it, essentially a bag of old clothing. And in that bag, he found this old turquoise coat, had a couple of ping pong balls, and he cut that coat up, sewed it up, did a dance, and made some magic instantly created history, right, with uh, Kermit. But back then, Kermit wasn't a frog. Kermit was more of an abstract lizard. And the reason for that was, was because he was part of a public access show that a very young Jim Henson created called Sam and Friends, where we had Sam, this humanoid character, and the wild amount of ridiculous characters inside Sam's brain. There were all these kind of abstract characters, and Kermit was one of them. Her name is Luna, she's a peach, but don't leave food within her reach, or baby. Originally, Kermit didn't even have a voice. It wasn't Jim Henson's voice. Sam and Friends was mostly uh, lip syncing to comedy albums, children albums, you know, pre-produced stuff. It was just a fun way to make fun of uh, songs, records, comedy bits, comedy sketches, uh, but interpreted them differently with abstract characters and weird scenarios. And that was on WRC TV. So the, the first Kermit that Jim built for Sam and Friends for this public access show was really nothing more than a glorified sock puppet. It was just a long tube with a, with a mouth at the end that was just two pieces of cardboard kind of glued into some fabric to give the mouth a little bit of rigidity. But otherwise, it was just an arm and a hand covered in fabric. And Jim Henson had massive hands, huge hands, to the chagrin of many a puppeteer later in life that needed to puppeteer Kermit while Jim was on stage doing another character. And so what you end up getting was this very articulate kind of expressions and movements in the head and face of Kermit the Frog because it was literally all four of Jim's fingers kind of morphing and moving and changing up and down. So it took about 10 years for Kermit to figure out uh, that he was a frog, right? It took it took Kermit about 10 years to find his legs, but I'm boom. Uh, <laughs> okay, I cannot give myself my own rim shots in the episodes. That's just not gonna work. <laughs> Remember Kermit the Frog? Yeah. It wasn't until Johnny Carson introduced Kermit as Kermit the Frog in December of 1965 that Kermit kind of became identified as a frog. And when these characters became so popular on this public access show, it didn't take long for the news to get all the way up to New York. And before he knew it, Jim was on the Ed Sullivan Show or with Johnny Carson performing these Muppet bits for the nation. It wasn't just a Washington DC local thing anymore. And uh, as Kermit began to grow up, he was re built shortly after his um, his big national TV spot started to drop uh, as he started to appear at all these talk shows. And um, he got this red sweater, right? They just threw him in this random red sweater, maybe to give him a little contrast, have him stand out on TV. The first toy that was made of Kermit in 1966 was him wearing his red sweater. But um, hey, when is he gonna get green again, right? He didn't sing a song, it's not easy wearing a red sweater, all right? <laughs> And that happens. That happens um, just shortly after that in the late 60s when a little thing called Sesame Street starts to get created, right? Joan Gans Cooney in the late 60s is like, hey, let's start to create this developmental show for children that's educational, that's smart, that's actually gonna benefit children, uh, but how are we gonna make this fun? How are we gonna make this interesting? And the answer to that was uh, puppets. And so they wrestled up Jim Henson and brought him on board, and uh, Jim started to create a bunch of original characters for the show. Bert and Ernie, Big Bird, Snuffleupagus. 
but a couple of characters from his original kind of catalog of uh, Muppets kind of came along with them, primarily Kermit, right? So Kermit came to Sesame Street, but he never was officially a Sesame Street character. He was kind of like a visitor. As long as Jim was around, Kermit could be around. And with Sesame Street's uh, late 60s premiere, and we got a brand new Kermit, right? Kermit gets kind of completely rebuilt. This is where we get the iconic green Kermit collar, okay? Um, he didn't always have it. As you've seen so far, we've been missing that collar. He ditches that sweater and he throws on this collar. And what this collar does is really help hide the otherwise very obvious neck seam around uh, where the head of the puppet connects with the body of the sewn puppet. And here, now as Kermit's being rebuilt, we lose that whole kind of um, sock puppet design and Kermit begins to get more of a shape. He gets a belly that's built out with a little bit of foam, makes him a really fun, versatile character. And his time on the street was spent, you know, as the news reporter. Pardon me, sir. Uh, can you tell me, are you really uh, indeed Prince Charming? And Kermit was huge on Sesame Street. He was a huge character. He was super, super popular. What he's talking about, my dear girl, is simply that he was a frog. When uh, Kermit appeared in this made-for-TV special called Hey Cinderella, right after the second season of Sesame Street, there was this big uproar about the commercialism of Kermit the Frog. But when he came back after that controversy, again, he got another rebuild. Uh, and one of the big significant uh, kind of changes in that rebuild was his color kind of got dual layered. He went and got um, a nice contrasting color around his neck instead of that matching green tone. And so by adding that yellow layer and kind of separating and differentiating that color palette, it made Kermit stand out a little bit more. The color didn't last long and it disappeared shortly after it appeared. Another thing that they did was they kind of tweaked and modified the eye placement of his eyes to kind of uh, play around a little bit with the eye focus of the character. Because uh, as a puppeteer, when you're working and, and puppeteering into a camera, you have a monitor below you uh, underneath the set so you can kind of see where your character is looking. And the thing with Kermit was he was a frog and frogs are these wide-eyed, you know, things. Their eyes are kind of looking in two different directions, right? So how they catch flies so gosh darn good. As that character became more human and less abstract, uh, one of the things they did was kind of focus its eyes more inward to the point of its face. And this is a thing that they call the Henson Triangle or the or the uh, the, the eye focus triangle. Uh, and what you're doing is, hey, hold on one second, I have a friend to help me. Uh, so what that means is the section. <laughs> Yes, I happen to have a five foot tall Kermit plush. Deal with it. <laughs> what you see happen in the Sesame Street third season rebuild is that his eyes kind of are turned in a little bit more to match up with the tip of the nose. And you can see that uh, if you put the pupil to the pupil to the tip of the nose, it forms a triangle, right? And that allows the puppeteer to kind of understand where his, uh, his the, the tip of the, the puppet's nose is in relation to his hand. You can then very quickly understand where your character is looking and uh, it really helps establish a, a more life to the character. Sesame Street takes off, it's a huge success. And we're moving into the late 70s now where Jim branches off of uh, Sesame Street and wants to make something a little bit more adult, something a little bit more fun and, 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 and entertaining because that's what he was used to doing with you know the public access and Salmon Friends. It wasn't necessarily a kid's show, but puppets were involved. And Sesame Street really kind of set the stage of being like, puppets are for children. And Jim wanted to kind of break through that and be like, no, they're for everybody. There were some Muppet specials he did, the Muppet Valentine special, uh, Muppet Sex and Violence. Uh, just two specials that, um, you know, kind of didn't really take off and, and, and get seen uh, or appreciated. And one of the interesting things about both those specials was Kermit was not the host of either of those specials. Kermit was a background character, just another one of the, the gang. It's the Muppet Show with our very special guest star, Mr. Steve Martin. And it wasn't until The Muppet Show making this kind of variety hour hosted by Kermit where you live backstage and on stage and just all the antics ensued that we got Kermit as the leading man of The Muppets. They really uh, solidified the look of Kermit here in The Muppet Show. In fact, the look that Kermit kind of gets is the look that almost kind of endures forever, more or less. Um, his collar gets a little bit uh, tweaked to removing it from a 13 point to an 11 point, making each of those little triangles just a little bit wider, a little bit thicker, and then boom, locks set, we now have the iconic Kermit that we kind of have forever. But that doesn't mean they don't tweak him, doesn't mean they don't do some strange things with Kermit, and doesn't mean that we don't get some weird Kermit variants. With that, <laughs> with the riveting success of the Muppet Show, <laughs> I can't do it with a straight face, man.
The late 70s, 1979, with the riveting success of The Muppet Show, the Muppets now get to go to the big screen. And that movie was a huge hit, right? Everyone loves that original Muppet movie. Uh, and it had a pretty iconic Kermit moment in there. Kermit on a bike, right? I mean, everyone loves that Kermit on a bike uh, scene. And uh, this wasn't actually the first time Kermit's been on a bike. All the way back in the Muppets Valentine special, there was a little vignette of Kermit riding a bike, but that was done by these little rod puppets. There was just someone under the set with a little rod rolling it forward. Later in Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas, we see Kermit riding a bike, but again, that's a smaller scale Kermit done with a little marionette over top of that little miniature set. But when the Muppet movie happened, we had a full-size Kermit on a full-size bike. The the way that they did that is kind of incredible with a hu with huge cranes and they were massive marionettes. That's all they were. They were just propped up by really large strings when Kermit and Miss Piggy were kind of riding solo. But later when you see them in a group, they went even further with their cleverness. And what do you do when you have multiple bikes that you need to keep upright? Well, you just attach them together with long metal rods. And so they had all those Muppets in those group scenes all just attached together on real bikes, by the way, with their feet just attached to the pedals and the handlebars rigged up so that when the bikes were all pulled forward, all the Muppets just looked like they were pedaling and having a good time bouncing along that arc path. Absolute genius that they, they kind of came up with. The Great Muppet Caper, we have a lot of fun. You know, there's, there's robberies, there's musical numbers, but there's something interesting to take a look at in this movie, and it's Kermit's fabric, the fabric that he's built out of. The, the really cool thing about the fleece that they make the puppets out of is that it's designed in a way that if you use a very specific kind of stitch, which everyone calls the Henson stitch, or it might also be called a ladder stitch if you're more familiar with traditional sewing terms, uh, they're able to sew the fleece together in a way that makes seams almost disappear. In fact, sometimes if it's done really, really well, you can't tell where the puppet's seams are, right? I mean, if you think about it, these puppets are made out of flat materials, foam and fabric, and then are sewn and glued in ways to make them round in 3D shapes. What's really cool about Antron fleece is that it's dual layered, almost like carpet, right? Imagine those carpet samples you sat on the floor of in elementary school when you were a kid, and how they had that hard uh, plastic backing underneath it, and then all the loose fibers were kind of stitched through it. That's kind of similar to how Antron fleece works. It's a, a plush fabric that is rolled through a lot of uh, grinders that lifts the pill of the fabric up, but it's still leaves this thin underlying uh, kind of material that you can sew into. And so if you sew together those bottom pieces and then fluff up the top, what you end up with is a very clean line that's very hard to see, specifically on camera if it's lit and shot well. And as we remember here with my good friend Kermit, you can see he has a big line right down the center of his face. In the Muppet Caper movie, uh, Kermit has a lot of scenes where that seam in particular is stitched a little bit roughly. It wasn't necessarily picked and, uh, and and brushed, and Kermit's very pilly in that movie. He's very fuzzy. He's got a lot of like, you know, like, you know, like a, a couch cushion after, you know, two decades of people sitting on it. How it gets all kind of fuzzy and you gotta get one of those things as seen on TV and it shaves it. You know, you shave your pillows, cause that's a thing people do now. They go out and shave their pillows. Well, the same thing happens to Muppets. The fleece gets fuzzy. And in Great Muppet Caper, you can kind of see uh, that fuzz getting in the way of the efficiency of that line hiding. Mid eighties, we get Muppets take Manhattan and we get a very defining moment in the history of Muppets, right? The Muppet Babies, okay? We get this, this cut to fantasy scene of all the Muppets as children. Why Kermit isn't a tadpole? I have no really good answer for you. And um, they made these adorable little, little baby Muppets. They're so, you just wanna, and then they had those McDonald's toys and everyone had them. Everyone had a small plush, Fozzie, Piggy, or, or, or Kermit that smelled of fry oil that we all loved and was a, a really smart marketing plan by McDonald's to get children to cuddle with things that smell like their food. Just absolutely genius. We haven't seen that level of marketing, I don't think, since. It's like if every Happy Meal came with a fry scented Yankee candle. You know what I mean? It's like, go home and light up the scent of fry. But the Muppet Babies, right? They were so big that they got animated, right? The Muppets became a cartoon show. And now it's it's 2020 and the Muppet Babies are still on TV. That's how absolutely iconic they are. That's not the only big thing that happens in 1984, okay? 1984 is a big year for the Muppets because we get Muppets Take Manhattan, we get Muppets Babies, but then we also get Muppets on tour. That's right. And they had articulated, full-bodied, 
uh, Muppets. The Sesame Street characters are kind of doing this with Ice Follies. They were appearing in, in touring shows and kind of gaining some popularity. So it kind of made sense to take the Muppets out on tour for big musical numbers with, you know, big dance productions and sets and special effects. And it was so popular, it ran for two years. Um, and then they translated that touring company into a Muppet Babies live tour. All the characters are a little strange. Uh, Kermit, there's just something about hands that are that size with fingers that are that long that just shouldn't happen, all right? It just shouldn't happen. They tried that out with Dr. Facilier when he was appearing in the parks with these super long ganky fingers. I've talked about it before in, a, in another video. And uh, my goodness, long fingers with costume characters is just not a very uh, a pleasant thing to experience. <laughs> oh my gosh, it, it, it's time for the show. Um... Where is everybody? Um. In 1990, in Hollywood Studios, we get a live Muppet show in the parks, okay? And this comes at a very tragic time in Muppets history because Disney was trying to buy the Muppets. Jim was gonna sell it, sign a creative contract with Disney, start making movies. There was lots planned in the parks. The Muppets were gonna take over Disneyland at one point. If you haven't watched the Defunctland episode of Muppetland, uh, that's one that I was very involved with. Uh, so you definitely wanna check that out because it tells the story of the 1990 kind of deal and what the Muppets were gonna do in the park and take over Disneyland. By, by the time Jim passed, there was already a lot of stuff in production for the parks, such as uh, Here Come the Muppets, the, the live show. Mickey's like, hey, I gave you a show. How's it going? And Kermit's like, hey, it's going great. And no, no Muppets are there. Uh, and then eventually the monorail crashes into the Hollywood studios for no one. Ex there's no attack. The monorail, there, there's no, I don't know how Dr. Teeth, the electric uh, mayhem band showed up at Hollywood studios in the monorail, but they did. And it's fantastic. It's such a great show. But Kermit's fingers are so gosh darn unsettling. In the 2000s, when they brought Kermit back into the parks for just a hot second. Celebrating 100 years of magic, they brought Kermit back out. And uh, he kept the long fingers, but also he got the thickest neck. The thickest, most unsettling neck. <laughs> just Kermit just doesn't work like this, guys. We need to stop trying to translate Kermit into a walk around character. It's not going to work ever. Please stop. Everyone, please stop. <laughs> Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here, and welcome to Muppet Vision 3D. Muppet Vision 3D was the last thing that Jim performed as Kermit and directed. And so it's kind of this very iconic uh, place in Muppet history for being this last performance of Kermit by Jim. The fire truck that comes in at the end with that Kermit on the end of the fire truck, really great example of another variation of, a, of an RC controlled Kermit that was being puppeteered off stage behind the camera, uh, but was this really great little articulate robot that Jim was able to puppeteer. Muppet Vision 3D is just one of the best parts of the parks. I mean, really, I absolutely love Muppet Vision. It's one of the one of my one of the best attractions. The early 90s, we get this passing of the torch from Jim puppeteering Kermit to Steve Whitmire puppeteering Kermit, and uh, the, the kind of the change uh, begins to happen where we begin to realize very clearly that it wasn't just Kermit that was the star. It wasn't uh, the Muppets that were the star, but Jim Henson himself was an iconic superstar. Everyone knew who he was and everyone was in love with him. Losing him really impacted the role of uh, Kermit with the Muppets and kind of impacted the Muppets in, in general because after Jim went, uh, the, the movies then quickly became about the human star of the movie because the Muppets just didn't have the star power to keep their own movies afloat. And uh, the Muppets kind of became a cover band. Uh, mid 90s, we kind of get Muppets tonight. Uh, Kermit kind of stays the same. There's a little bit of a modification with the build on his head. His head shape changes a little bit. His eye focus again is tweaked once again. Uh, the location of his eyes are moved. Uh, in the early 2000s, we get swamp ears, right? We get to see what Kermit looks like as a teenager. And he just is so gosh darn cute. And they do some really fun stuff by making his eyes a little bit bigger for the smaller puppet to give him this kind of more of a youthful look uh, with the placement of the eyes, the size of the eyes, because that's why we think babies are adorable. They have gigantic eyes and tiny heads. And that's the same way that Muppet babies work. And also the same way that little uh, teenager Kermit or little young Kermit uh, who finally left the swamp and started talking to humans for the first time. A few years later, we get Muppets Wizard of Oz and we get a really fun variant of Kermit as Scarecrow Kermit. 
uh, Kermit is so iconically simple and uh, and recognizable, they can play with the simple idea of Kermit and say, dress him up like a scarecrow or give him a bunch of teeth and have him be a big scary dinosaur. It's really incredible how universal the design elements of Kermit kind of translate into whatever kind of variants they want to make. In 2010, the Muppets hosted a huge event for Walt Disney World with volunteering. Uh, in fact, if you volunteered uh, for a day of your time to a charity, a specific charities, uh, what you ended up getting was a day in the parks for free. And the campaign was hosted by the Muppets. And there was a parade in the in the parks with all the volunteers that was led by Kermit and Piggy in their own unique parade vehicle. And this was a, a new Kermit that was built specifically the, for the parks that was bigger than any Kermit had ever been built before. It was probably about 120 uh, to 130 percent larger than, uh, than than say the standard Kermit because it was really high up on a float so that they read a little bit better from the top of that parade float. Disney's all about forced perspective, right? He's just really built strong because he's practically weatherproof because he was outdoors a lot, being used quite regularly. The thing you don't, the thing you might not realize about puppets in general is that they tend to break down and uh, become in need of desperate repair after a certain point of time. You can do that. You can skin a puppet, completely rebuild its innards, replace all the foam, replace all the hinges, then re-sew everything back up. Things like theme park puppets, that's not necessarily in the budget. So they're going to build these things like tanks. And so this was a little bit of a Kerm Tunk. Uh, <laughs> The minute I said that he was built like a tank, I then knew that I had to combine the words Kermit and tank, but I couldn't figure out what it would sound like, what that word would sound like in my head. And the minute that it came out of my mouth, I was so in love with it. So, <laughs> so this puppet was essentially the Kertunk and Kertunk uh, lives on Muppets Most Wanted had an interesting kind of twist on Kermit with Constantine, right? Performed by Matt Vogel, who now is the primary performer of Kermit, took over for Steve in 2017. Uh, and what's really fun about Constantine is that they just make very minor modifications to the design of Kermit. Again, commenting on the simplicity of Kermit, just by taking his eyes and twisting them inward a little bit, uh, kind of like, you know, cartoon eyebrows when they're a little bit more menacing. When Matt Vogel puppeteered him, he kind of kept the nose pointed down where Kermit's nose is always forward and, you know, having a good time. Uh, very, very minor performance uh, variations and then design variations to differentiate Constantine and uh, Kermit the Frog. Of course, that mole, right, obviously. But uh, if you don't think about that mole, there are other things that went into making Constantine stand out and be unique. Another thing about Muppets Most Wanted in that movie is we got old Kermit, right? We have a, a really wide range of what Kermit looks like um, throughout his entire life. So there you go, there's Kermit. He, he had a lot of changes for someone as so simple, but those changes were very subtle over the years to refine that character and make him more streamlined, more fun and friendly and connectable. And what's really kind of uh, tragic was losing Jim and losing that presence and that, and that, and that, that status that Jim brought to the Muppets and to Kermit himself. Now that we've passed the torch to Steve and then from Steve to Matt, Matt has uh, the world in front of him now, kind of being a little bit of a leader like Jim was in a way behind the camera, uh, not just in front of the camera, you know? And so who knows what Kermit is going to uh, see and do next. In fact, Disney Plus has uh, Muppets Now, uh, which is a, a, a really fun uh, kind of live improvised Muppets thing. But um, I didn't really dig too deeply into the history of the Muppets in this episode because we, well, I already have. I helped uh, Kevin over in Defunkland make his six part Jim Henson miniseries. So go over there and take a look at uh, really the life and times of Jim and uh, check out Uploading Walt Disney World, my buddy Kenny Johnson, who has in my office that is full of Kermit stuff uh, or patreon.com slash Disney Dan, where I'll have some behind the scenes look at my massive Kermit collection um, because there's, I just have so much. This is just a, a, a schmeckin of my Kermit, um, <laughs> of my Kermit paraphernalia. I have Kermit silly bands, all right? Kermit silly bands. So <laughs> thanks for watching guys. Find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Patreon. Come say hello. Let me know in the comments uh, which Kermit uh, is your favorite. What appearance in a movie or, or TV show? What silly Kermit gag? What's your favorite Kermit song? Tell me about your favorite Kermit memories. I can't wait to uh, hear them. Thanks for watching, guys. 
you rock. Hello. Oh, I'd like to inquire about my annual pass and what I'm supposed to do with it. <laughs>